Hello, and welcome to our WEP 2021 event on submarine cable networks. It gives me great pleasure to welcome my friend and friend of KAUST, Mr. Eve Pope, to WEP. When the theme of connectivity was announced for this year's WEP, my thoughts immediately jumped to Eve's to contribute. Throughout his long career, he's been at the leading edge of connecting networks together. Eves has always been a pioneer, a trailblazer, and an advocate for global research and education networking. While working at Tata in the early 90s, he helped deliver the first transoceanic research and education link at 34 megabits per second. We laugh now, but at the time, that was a huge, huge deal. Um, his work continued, and by 2001, he delivered the first gigabit level transoceanic connections for research and education. 12 years after that, Eve contributed to the first uh, transatlantic 100 gigabits connectivity with the ANA 100 project. And in 2014, whilst with ASTAR, he facilitated the first trans-Pacific 100 gig RNE connection uh, between SingRN in Singapore and uh, Internet2 in the US. More recently, Eve has been contributing to the InfiniCortex project, um, an approach for concurrent computing between geographically distributed supercomputers. And today, he advises the National Supercomputing Center of Singapore, the NSCC, on transcontinental supercomputing connectivity, connecting HPC systems to each other across thousands of kilometers to share data and resources. This is all very impressive, but the one thing that stands out about Eves to me personally is not only is he a highly, highly skilled at building networks, he's highly skilled at networking people and networking those people together to make transcontinental projects work. Eves represents the NSCC at Giant, Internet2, Canary, Glyph, ASREN, and APAN, where he's also the chair of the Backbone Committee. Personally, I've learned a lot from him over the years. Eves has consulted on the original build out of the KAUST network in 2009, as well as more recently on our global network expansion that will be announced on January 21st. I always love hearing his expert insights, and I'm excited for you all to hear them today. So please welcome Mr. Eve Pope. Thank you very much, Ken. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, unfortunately, I could not be in, uh, at Coast today. I'm uh, in Canada, where in Montreal, to be precise, where it's uh, 3.15 in the morning, so it's uh, quite early for me. So it's dark outside, and of course, there is snow, as there always has to be in this uh, season in Canada. If you allow me, I will now share the presentation and uh, I would like uh, with you today to go over the history of uh, subsea cables. In fact, I looked up when the first subsea cables uh, came in in front of the university. So we will see that in just a moment if you allow me. I hope the sharing works. It's a quite a something. We are talking about connectivity, and the connectivity is obviously very important. And I, I think uh, now that we are all remote, I think it's even more important than ever. The last year has been quite something. I was supposed to talk at six. Uh, at six conferences and all of them ended up being virtual. So we start to have some experience in virtual things. So let me continue. So research at the speed. Again, we're connecting the global research and education community. 
that's one thing. And uh, we started that a long time ago, in fact. And uh, if we look back at the very first uh, cable we had in, uh, in the Red Sea, that was back in uh, 1870. And it was, of course, a telegraph cable in those days. And uh, Great Britain was uh, still a world power. So they were the very first ones to go and install uh, cables going all the way from, uh, from Europe to essentially what used to be the uh, possessions of the British Empire in uh, those days. So here we see the, uh, the first connectivity back in 1870. And uh, in fact, it all started, uh, as you probably know, with, uh, with Samuel Morse, who uh, in 1846 had set up the first uh, telegraph line between uh, Washington and Baltimore. And then he got some funding and uh, then the first cables were, in fact, the first transatlantic cable was built just before the Civil War in the States. I think it lasted uh, 15 minutes, then the cable went down, then the next one was uh, built just uh, after the, the war, after the Civil War, and uh, here we are. Now, if you would go back in time and you go back to Suez and see the Eastern Telegraph company, that's what it looked like. And on the right side, in fact, they even started the uh, Happy New Year and the Christmas card from the Aden landing station. So this is some time ago. So what happened is after the, the first uh, Atlantic cable, there's a John Pander in the States, is an interesting man. Uh, he would suggest uh, you go to the uh, internet and uh, search up his name and see uh, what he's done. So basically, he put together a project to, uh, to finance an Egypt to uh, India cable. And uh, of course, like always, it took some time to get the money together. Finally, he found the money. And in uh, late 69, it, uh, it started to, uh, to work. And uh, so it went from uh, from the UK to, uh, to Malta, from Malta to Alexandria. Then it crossed the, from Alexandria to the Red Sea uh, on a terrestrial basis. And uh, that was basically the start of uh, the telegraph cable. Then uh, a second cable was, uh, was built in uh, later in the 70s, and uh, it was a four-section cable. It went from Suez to Suakim to Perim, from there to Aden and Bombay. In fact, uh, if you don't know where Suakim is, Suakim is just on the other side of uh, you at the Red Sea, and uh, was quite uh, important. Uh, it's, it's an island, Suakim, and the British in those days, they like to have their cable landing stations in islands because they were more easy to defend against an eventual enemy. So uh, Suakin was uh, the first stop and the second stop was Perim. Perim, which is uh, also an island just on the other side of, uh, of Djibouti and uh, which was in fact a British possession until uh, 1967. Then a third cable came in uh, 84, and then a fourth cable, and the fifth cable in 1914, sixth cable in 1920 with uh, landing in Port Sudan. In fact, Port Sudan uh, took uh, priority because uh, the British developed uh, Port Sudan, in fact, uh, to the detriment of, uh, of Suakin, which is about uh, 60 kilometers uh, away from Port Sudan. So Port Sudan, became really the, the prime uh, site and also in fact Perim, which became a major uh, coal uh, station for the, uh, for the ships going up and down the, uh, the Red Sea. And in fact, the Perim then started to decline because the ships started to uh, shift from coal to oil in the 20th century. 
Then uh, very interesting from your point of view, the Saudi government back in 1926 supported an expansion of the uh, telegraph via the uh, submarine cable. And uh, that's when we first saw the first uh, telegraph cable uh, between Port Sudan and uh, Jeddah. And uh, initial rates were still high. It was quite uh, expensive to send the telegram in those days. And uh, what happened is uh, Mr. Marconi uh, started uh, transatlantic, in fact, between Newfoundland here in Canada and the UK with his wireless. Then the wireless became a real competitor of, uh, of cables. And uh, for a certain time, it even uh, looked as if uh, the wireless would win against subsea cables. And uh, then, of course, uh, there were some mergers. And uh, at the very end, it created a cable and wireless, who most of you will know, company which was created in 1934. <clears throat> also interesting to note is that the first uh, internet, the first global network was uh, Queen Victoria's uh, All Red Line. And the All Red Line uh, connected, in fact, uh, the UK to uh, Canada and then crossed Canada, went from there to Australia and from the other side uh, back to South Africa and to Europe. In fact, the, the last part to be built was uh, the South African part. And the main reason was the Boer War in uh, the early 1900s, and that necessitated their communication. So in fact, the network control center of that uh, global network was uh, at, uh, at the Queen's Castle. So she was, in fact, uh, the only one to, to know what really happened. Interesting enough, the, the British had nearly a monopoly on uh, international cables in those days because the French, for example, they didn't want or didn't believe in cables. They preferred wireless. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, that's one of the reasons the uh, Eiffel Tower still exists because after the Expo in Paris, the, the Parisians, they found that tower so ugly, they wanted to take it down. So the military said, no, we will keep it as a transmission tower for a wireless communication. So that's the reason we still have the Eiffel Tower. If we look further in time, back in the 20s, things uh, evolved and uh, we had the uh, global network really evolving. And that was uh, really the golden period. And uh, the telegraph business really grew. And uh, there was major, one major problem, which was uh, capacitance. And uh, in fact, that was because of the coating, which was gutta percha, which is a kind of a rubber, kind of a latex, which uh, comes from tree. And it comes from India, essentially. So the, the British also made sure that they had a monopoly on uh, the Gutta Persia. So nobody else could uh, make cables the way they did. Then the race was for better insulation and inline repeaters, because of course, on long uh, subsea cables, uh, it really goes down in capacity. So uh, the answer was uh, loading the cable, so means an alloy tape with the magnetic properties just to uh, boost the signal. In uh, 1924, you have to remember, <coughs> well, I remember, I think, not many of us will remember, but that the cable transmission at a rate of 1500 words, then with uh, some progress, it went up to 8,000. Then came the famous modern coax cable with the uh, at and Bell Labs using polyethylene. And that was another huge leap uh, forward. And uh, at the end of World War I, obviously, uh, the whole cable business 
really could uh, start again. And uh, in fact, uh, what was uh, quite interesting also is that there was a big debate between the pro cable and the pro wireless people. And uh, the pro cable people really argued, hey, wireless is not uh, that secure because it's easier for, for uh, eavesdropping. And in the end, uh, the government in the States decided, hey, you will use both and carry part of the traffic over cable and part over wireless. Then uh, things really stayed uh, uh, static in, uh, in the 30s, 40s, and in the 50s, uh, something interesting happened, and that was the, uh, the vacuum cubes, which could operate underwater. And uh, one of the consequences with that famous capacity boost is that finally you could talk on that cable. There was enough capacity to talk because before uh, the major transatlantic and very long distance uh, communication was wireless. So we had the, the era of uh, subsea coax cables following the telegraph cables. <coughs> the first transmission on the coax cable was at the uh, Summer Olympics in, uh, in Berlin in 1936. Uh, then uh, they tried in, uh, in the US. And in 1956, that one, the transatlantic cable, became the first transoceanic cable between Scotland and Newfoundland. In uh, 1978, yeah, that the cable was in fact uh, retired, which uh, was a good, a good life. So the cables had the, the capacity for 35 <clears throat> simultaneous telephone calls, and one channel was used for a telegraph. Then, uh, as I said, the TAT7 was the last of the family in 1978. By that time, it had uh, 4,000 channels, and by the last the end of its life, it went up to 10,500 channels. Then, in the mid 70s, it seemed that satellite would dominate again. These were the days of Telstar, etc. But that was again short lived. Cable eventually won, and the reason was famous fiber optics, which we all use uh, today. And in fact, fiber optic. Cables are not that old. The very first international subsea cable was between the UK and Belgium in 1986. And in 1988, we had that eight as the first transoceanic optical cable. And then we had a, a whole family of TAT cables installed. And obviously, with every one, the capacity uh, increased and in 1992, if you see the TAT9, it had 80,000 channels and then they started to count in megabyte, megabit per second instead of channels. So it's, the channel is a 64K. And time went on. And uh, in 1994, we had CANTAT3, which uh, ran from, uh, from Canada to, uh, to Germany. And that's a cable I was personally involved in. I'm quite proud of that cable. And uh, at that time, it was uh, doubling the capacity under the uh, Atlantic with five gigabit per second. And engineering at the time said it will take 17 years to fill that cable. And uh, I was on the data side. I said, well, OK. Then there was one thing which came up at the time. It's called the internet. So we had the consultant then who said, well, internet, there's absolutely no future. That's just a curiosity for the universities. Serious people do broadband, ISDN, and ATM. And we know what happened. In fact, the cable filled up very fast. And that gave rise to the private cables. And the uh, Global Crossing was the very first one in 98. 
And that was basically the end of the TAT series. So we had uh, the Hibernia cable, we had Atl Atlantic cross crossing, and uh, we had cable and wireless installing one in 2003. And that was the last cable for quite a while. Why did that happen? Is, sorry, we had the famous great century, turn of the century turmoil. And the reason there is, as I mentioned, with Kanta Tree, the internet tsunami filled the cables in, the, in three years, not 17. Then there was the famous DWDM, Dance Wave Division Multiplexing, which, which was a magic potion because had anyone said hey, back in 94, be careful in your investment, in five years they will be ca building cables with 1,000 times the capacity, we would, we would have said you are totally crazy. This cannot happen. Now a cable is built, uh, one cable like that costed uh, $500 million, the amortization period for a cable is normally 2025 period. And basically after five years, the cost of maintenance of that cable was already higher than the cost of a new cable. So uh, one has to be careful. And obviously we had deregulation in those days, easy access to capital on top of that uh, famous uh, advance in technology. Then the internet was growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, MCI said, ha, oh, it doubles every three months. So every one thought it was a gold rush. And the end result was the famous great telecom recession of 2001, which took two, 12 years to, uh, the bridge. So the Atlantic revival came finally in 2015 with the Hibernia Express. Then it, uh, it continued. In fact, nowadays, what's interesting is no longer the carriers who are building cables, it's the hyperscalers. It's Facebook, it's uh, Microsoft, it's uh, Google, and uh, it's Facebook. And that's where we see the new cables and uh, they have huge capacities. And uh, the next one we'll see is the Grace Hopper cable, which has 16 fiber pairs and uh, this capacity has not been disclosed. If we now go back to the region, uh, if we see the cables, it became a spaghetti of cables. A number of one have been installed and if we uh, really look at the uh, Jeddah, in Jeddah we have the Sudan cables, as we said, the Port Sudan <coughs> has been quite uh, important. We have the IMIWI cable, the EIG, CMUI, three and four, flag, MENA, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, most of them will land in Jeddah. So uh, it's a real, uh, favorite and a favorable location for cable landing. If we now zoom out, uh, we'll see that we had the first of a CMUI. The first of the CMUI was uh, in 1984. Don't forget, no new cables had been installed in uh, the Red Sea since the late 20s. So there the consortium built the CMUI one, which uh, went uh, online and uh, was retired uh, in 99. So it was a major achievement. Then came a whole series of CMUIs. It was a CMUI two, three, four, five, and there will be a CMUI six also planned for 2022 if uh, all goes well. It could be delayed because there are some arguments on who the supplier should be. CMUI 5 is still operational and CMUI 4 also, and CMUI 3 is still operational. So after 20 years and uh, anticipated end of service in September. Other cables, Flag, Falcon, TGN Eurasia, IMIWI, IEG, MENA cable, 
AAE1 cable, very important to the region and is going on. Now, if one looks at the worldwide subsea connectivity today, the geography shows a map and I would really recommend to access it. It shows 441 cable as cable investment boom, a little one going on. And then we will see what happens. The COVID pandemic has resulted in an increase in global traffic, <coughs> which should uh, subside, but uh, that we will see. Then what to expect in the coming years? That's always interesting because again, we went from telegraph to coax to uh, fiber optics. The capacity increased, the cost went down. So basically it's still uh, evolving. We have uh, the rodent, the out at drop uh, multiplexing in uh, in the undersea branching unit. So basically in the next phase we'll be, be able to, uh, to reroute fiber pairs, which has not never been done before. Progress in uh, laser optics and uh, technology continues. In fact, I was reading uh, yesterday in Finera announced uh, that they now achieved the transatlantic 30 terabit per second on a single wave uh, across the Atlantic on the Maria cable. And then we have space division multiplexing. We have aluminum conductors, which increases fiber pairs. That's the reason Google now will have uh, 16 pairs on, uh, on the new cable, which are, they are building between uh, Portugal and South Africa. And we have now the famous optical amplifiers. Again, 32 pairs will be coming in my opinion. Now, will history itself repeat itself? If you look at geo telegeography, they expect an, an exponential growth continuing for the next, uh, sorry, for the next 15 years. So will it grow and uh, at what cost? No, the question is, could history repeat itself? Could we have another meltdown in uh, that industry. Now, of course, consortium spreads the risk per gigabit costs have to decline nearly as fast as projected because uh, cost cannot go up. And uh, in order to have your video, you cannot have a, a rate of 20 years ago. That would not work. Not work. And then uh, the economy, as we all know, and our well-being is totally dependent on affordable access to the information. So a lot of things has uh, changed since the <laughs> last meltdown, and uh, and they will have uh, what 5G, 6G, in Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, smart cities, autonomous vehicles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then that will absorb all the capacity. Just to uh, conclude, because we are running slowly out of time, connecting costs and the global research and education community. This is a subset of uh, that subsea cable story and which uh, we are very close by and uh, which is very important to us. And it's in fact the global re research and education connectivity, which has kept me busy for the last 20 years. So why do we need dedicated research? Uh, one main reason is the sharing of instruments, which uh, are generating phenomenal amounts of data. We're all familiar with the uh, CERN in Geneva, with the Large Hadron Collider, for example, which uh, by itself already would, would fill total cables. We have the on the astronomy side, the LSST, the Synoptic Telescope in, uh, in South America, that really also will generate dreams of data. We have the LIGO, 
project, the gravitational waves. Uh, everyone is talking about gravitational waves these days. There's SKA, the square kilometer array in South Africa and uh, in Australia. There's the ITER project uh, based in France, which uh, is for nuclear uh, fusion. So that will all ask for a lot of capacity and a lot of transmission. And then we have our famous supercomputing and storage going with it. So in order to uh, satisfy these needs, we have our global research and uh, education network, which uh, obviously spans the globe. And uh, of course, COAST is in the middle and uh, is now connecting soon to East and West. Global NREN connectivity as seen from uh, Singapore. We have the uh, crossing of the Pacific. We have 100 gig from, uh, from Singapore to, uh, to uh, Hong Kong and Japan. Then we just announced 100 gig from uh, Japan to, uh, to the US West Coast, which is totally a Singaren NSCC owned. Uh, we plan on having a connection to Guam. In fact, uh, the connection to Guam is because now with the political situation, it's more difficult to go to the US via Hong Kong. So uh, Guam is, is US, so we'll have a connection probably to Guam. There will be one Tokyo to Guam, Guam to, Sing to uh, Australia is up and running, and from there we go to the US. Coast connectivity at Netherlands, again, all the research network are will be accessible, are accessible in fact. Then same thing on the uh, on the Singer insight. So uh, Singapore with its uh, geographical location is the logical place to land, and from there you can connect to uh, to everyone in the region. And uh, obviously. Uh, traffic would be depending on the bilateral uh, cooperation between uh, supercomputing essentially at the coast and uh, in the other countries. If we look at the European side again, uh, from the Netherlands, you can then access all European research and education network via GEAN, which is the transnational trans-European network. If we now cross the Atlantic, we started with 100 gig, as uh, Kevin was mentioning back in 2014, and now basically are growing to uh, one terabit. And there the key is a mutual backup and the mutual transit and cost sharing between all participants to make everything more affordable. And uh, we are reaching one terabit on uh, the Atlantic and uh, probably will reach one terabit also on the Pacific in a couple of years. Then uh, South America is, is quite uh, surprisingly advanced. One of the, of the reason is the Atacama uh, telescopes in uh, Chile, the famous LSST project I was mentioning. This, uh, this is slowly starting to generate uh, quite the amount, big amounts of data. Then another interesting uh, advance is the connectivity between uh, Brazil, Fortaleza, and the Cape Town uh, via Angola. <coughs> South Africa, as we said, is important because of the SKA project. Then uh, South America connects to Europe directly. There you have the South American uh, research community and Géant who are buying a capacity on the LLN cable. So this is the new trend now. The, uh, the research and education will not release slow capacity. I think they will buy outright fiber pairs as time goes by. South African perspective is a very 
interesting. Again, the, as we said, they go to Fortaleza already. They have capacity to Europe via the uh, west and east side uh, of uh, Africa. And they also think of buying Spectrum on a new cable. So this is quite a, a very important progression. If we look at Asia again from Singapore, we have connectivity to all the Southeast Asian research network and uh, Australia. And uh, this is evolving uh, quite, quite uh, nicely. I'm proud to, to be part of the uh, backbone committee for that part of the world. And uh, we're also happy that uh, Europe is co-funding part of that connectivity. Now, this will conclude my presentation. In fact, I was quite surprised that uh, cables are now used beyond telecommunications in the long distance. I was, this is a project to transmit power. And uh, in fact, the only cable project to transmit power I knew of was uh, in the St. Lawrence here in Lower Canada, where a cable was built across the St. Lawrence to uh, transmit power from one side to the other. It's quite, uh, quite uh, uh, challenging to, buy subs to uh, build subsea cables for power. And here you have, and that, if that materializes, again, it's a matter of funding, it will provide 20% of the power in Singapore because obviously power is important and is also an important for our supercomputers in the future. So that will conclude what was a very fast tour of the world. I hope I did not confuse you too much with that uh, plethora of subsea cables and going through history that fast. And uh, again, on the internet nowadays, you can find a lot of information and I encourage you to do so because uh, it's uh, very interesting to see how in fact we are able to, uh, to talk to each other. Because if you look at it uh, from home, it goes through my uh, internet provider. It goes via a transatlantic cable. I don't know which one. In fact, if I would do a trace route, I, uh, I would know it. Then uh, it crosses probably the Mediterranean on one of these cables we were talking about to uh, go to Jeddah and uh, from there to coast. And this is the miracle of our modern technology. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Eve. That's, uh, that's fascinating as ever. Um, and I really enjoy hearing, especially all around the, 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 the history. Um, so if you don't mind, um, we've got a couple of uh, questions that have come in. If you can um, stop the presentation so we can, we can see you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a couple of, yeah, these are kind of fun, interesting questions for you. Um, the first one uh, relates around marine life and specifically um, sharks. There's some discussions around um, you know, sharks attacking cables and, uh, and everything else around, around that. Have, what, have you heard instances of this? Um, and uh, you know, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this? That's true. In, in fact, uh, there is a little bit of an urban legend on, uh, on these uh, phenomena. And in fact, uh, it was maybe, I, I don't know, the, the case with copper cables, because they did even experiments and the sharks, of course, are sensitive to magnetic fields. And uh, if you put a lot of uh, power <coughs> on, uh, on these cables, uh, they could attract sharks. Obviously, now we are, we are in the fiber optic age. So sharks will not eat fiber optics. They liked they liked uh, they liked copper more. But uh, here locally, I think the biggest problem is squirrels eating the cables. 
not sharks. So I, I think we can rest assured the sharks will not eat our future cables. Excellent. Thank you. So um, one of the other questions here relates to what happens to the cables once they've finished their active life? Um, are, are, they, are they retrieved or are they um, just left in the ocean? Yeah. In fact, they, most of them are left in the ocean. And uh, in, in fact, uh, here in, in Canada, the telegraph where I worked, there's a cable landing station on the, on the Pacific coast of Vancouver Island. And uh, there, if you like uh, scuba diving, you still can find pieces of the old telegraph cable of Her Majesty Queen Victoria back in 1902. Now, if you go to the, uh, to the Red Sea and uh, you do some, uh, some diving uh, next week, maybe you'll find some pieces of old cable also. So most of them are left because to retrieve them would just be uh, too expensive. Oh, but this was not true always for the telegraph cables. Some of the early telegraph cables were rerouted. In fact, some of the cables in the Red Sea around 1900 were rerouted to Port Sudan, for example. So one can re reroute cables. In modern days now, old cables are left. In fact, uh, some of the TAT cables, which were retired, are now used for uh, seismographic research because you can transmit very low wavelengths on these cables. So some science uh, projects are now using these very old cables. But to answer the question, most of them remain at the bottom of the ocean. Thank you. Yeah, the, the using the old cables for research is a very interesting angle. Uh, I yeah. hope to see that will uh, expand mm -hmm. in the future. Um, we're also getting a, a, a number of questions um, all broadly related to um, you know, the resiliency and redundancy of these, these cables, um, questions around um, what happens when a natural disaster occurs, you know, an earthquake under sea, for example, um, you know, how robust are these cables and what happens in the event um, of failures of these cables on, under the ocean? That's true. And, uh... Of course, uh, these happens cables are quite, uh, quite resilient. Uh, problems are sometimes on the uh, repeater side. The older when the cable gets older, the repeaters have to be replaced. Again, now everyone talks about preventive uh, replacement, etc. But uh, the major <coughs> risk uh, I have seen are uh, undersea uh, earthquakes and the tsunami. Uh, there was uh, one uh, famous uh, earthquake uh, not far from uh, Taiwan about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, that created an undersea uh, landslide. And uh, most cables, of course, have to go through narrow passes. So uh, basically, there were eight internet connections in, in those days. And of the eight internet, internet connections, six went down. So there were only two left. So it was a good thing that there was redundancy between the cables. So basically you have mu mutual backup and uh, mutual overflow. So basically one of the reasons uh, the internet is still quite reliable is uh, is that the famous uh, backup. Now, another aspect also is uh, Alexandria. There are a lot of cables going through Alexandria and there are a lot of ships of Alexandria. So it regularly happens that the ship will drop anchor and uh, then run away with a piece of cable. And uh, there, was, there was a case in, uh, in point where two cables were broken and all internet connections in Qatar were broken. That was uh, also, that was uh, 20 years ago in the meantime. Then Qatar decided that, hey, we cannot have all our traffic going west. We also have to go east. And since that day, they have capacity going to the US 
via Europe and also to the US via the Pacific. So we all have to help each other. And again, the more we are dependent, the more important it is. And of course, the ultimate backup is the satellite capacity for the very mission critical uh, transmission you will have a subset of the capacity going via satellite. If you look at the banking networks, for example, satellite will be the backup. So related <clears throat> to, to the, the satellites is, um, I understand there's some research around um, satellite communication with uh, lasers, terrestrial lasers for, um, for communication. Um, related to that, uh, do you do you see wireless technologies ever being able to to compete with the the, the um, you know, physical cables? We we've seen from your history, there's been periods in the past where this has started to happen, and and then there's been a, a technological leap uh, on the on the on the physical cable side. Um, but do you do you foresee a future where um, wireless communications will will leapfrog again, or do you think the status quo will continue? It's uh, of course it's always uh, difficult to to predict the future. Uh, I remember that also uh, around uh, the year 2000, with before at the it was a uh, Teleglobe before it became Tata at the time, and we invested a lot in uh, satellite communication, uh, thinking that uh, that wireless telephone, so mobile telephony, would be via satellite, and of course we lost our shirt because of the small cell approach. So there the satellite lost out and the small cells won. Now, if you look at it today, another aspect is cable technology, as we said, really progress. So you can transmit much more capacity via cable. And other problem is the satellites were too high. If you have geosynchronous satellites, you have what is it, uh, 240 milliseconds uh, to go up to the equator and, and back down? Now, obviously, if you look at it today, Google and uh, others, they all have the low orbit or medium orbit satellite project. If you look at Elon Musk at SpaceX, yeah, he's putting so many satellites in uh, in space small satellites that uh, that the astronomy people start to say hey we will not see the sky anymore so uh, will satellite win again i'm not no it, it has its display space again if you look uh, one of the arguments of uh, of space of the space project of uh, elon musk is to cover africa for example I, I'm not sure there is a market, but uh, to put a lot of money in it, uh, because don't forget also, a hundred and some years ago, when, uh, when it was said, tele Western Union Telegraph, huh? they our telegraph people, they had the, the opportunity to buy the, that uh, invention of Mr. Bell, Graham, Graham Bell. And then the board met and the Western Union people said, but how will you ever justify running with wires to every home? This is a no-no that will never happen. It's too expensive. So to buy the telephone thing there is, is a stupidity. Now we all know what happened. Everyone now has wire to the home. So, yeah, and also fiber. Yes, very good. So we're coming up on the end of our time, Eve. Uh, just one, one last question, um, and it's related to a little bit about what you what you talked around with, uh, with on 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 wireless, but um, with a spin for for the undersea cables, um, the security. Of undersea cables, um, you know, we we hear some uh, reports of um, 
submarine cables being uh, tapped or accessed via nation states. Um, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, on the security of these submarine cables um, and you know, what, the, what the global community is, is doing about that. Yeah. Well, the security of, uh, of cables is definitely a major concern. To go and tap a fiber optic, I think that would be a rather difficult project. Uh, it has been said that has been done uh, off Alexandria again. I, I don't believe it, but I think there is a bigger risk in, uh, in case of, uh, of tension. If you look at the World War I, the first thing the British did was to cut off all the German telegraph cables. And uh, in fact, it, that's one of the reasons, in my opinion, that, uh, that uh, the Allies won the war. And, if, and uh, that would happen again. There were some, some uh, articles uh, in the press, in the internet, that, uh, that the Russians, Russian submarines had spent a lot of time near cable landing stations. So one would say, oh, oh. And uh, I think uh, indeed, in case of conflict, uh, cable, uh, cables are vulnerable. That's, that's for sure. And that's where, again, the wireless people said, hey, look, this is more secure. And uh, again, there is room and there will remain room for, uh, for both satellites and cables in, uh, in case of emergencies. But the cables are secure and uh, don't forget also very soon now we have some projects so maybe cost will participate it for, for uh, quantum key distribution mm -hmm. so you distribute your quantum key via satellite and then you transfer it via cable then our information will be secure excellent well, that, that concludes our time today, Eve, and uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for waking up in the middle of the night to, uh, to come uh, you know, share your expertise. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure being with you. There is so much more to say, but uh, we'll do that in a, another time. You're most welcome. Thank you, Kevin, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.